Andrew, uh, good evening, right? It is. It is evening here, 7, 7 p.m. Yeah. 7 p.m. Yeah, you know, all those time zones, I always get confused. Early morning here, I mean, kind of, uh, yeah, getting direction noon. Uh, thank you so much, you know, for, for making the time, uh, joining me here on Frames. Um, quite a story behind your, you know, photographic career, uh, quite, a, quite a special one. Uh, and we will get to it. We'll, of course, get to, to the Rocket Girl Chronicles at some point here during our conversation. But first, you know, uh, could you just tell our viewers just a little bit about your, you know, maybe earlier photographic fascinations? You know, uh, I can imagine this project happened. I mean, it happened during the lockdown and kind of put you on the international scene relatively suddenly, right? But when when did the photographers, you know, fascinations start for you? Uh, what happened before the Rocket Girl? What was going on? Yeah, you know, like psychologists say, everything in your life can be traced back to your childhood. And I guess in my case, in a weird way, it was the fact that we didn't have cameras in our family. So like, I don't have any photographers or anyone in the immediate family or in our house who would have showed me how to use one. But my grandfather, who didn't live with us, just kind of lived in the same city, used to come over from time to time. And when he would bring his own camera and show, I guess, take our pictures as kids and kind of go away with it. It was this kind of mysterious object that I gravitated towards too, but I wasn't allowed to touch because obviously a camera is expensive and I was growing up in Soviet times when everything was quite scarce. So he was developing the films himself. So to me, it was like this great mystery that I was exposed to, but never had hands-on experience so I kind of just always wanted to figure out what it is it's like this kind of big bit of magic so I think it's kind of from that early age it just got into my brain as it's something that I want to compensate for I guess when I grow up so when I was uh, when I had my first job and I had some income I immediately kind of wanted to go and fulfill this gap and I bought my camera and just kind of started photographing here and there and just playing around and at my at one of my workplaces they saw my shots just like an amateur and they thought you know what these are good enough they are I guess better than some of people we hire do for us so how about you just do your photography for us for them it was like they're getting something better for free they don't have to hire a professional anymore and for me it was a great experience and then Some of these shorts got published in a magazine as advertising for our company. And actually, magazine editors saw them and said, how about you come and work for us? And that was definitely, I guess, the best hands-on practice for me because I got a variety of different assignments, shooting people, shooting gigs, shooting, uh, I guess, still life, all sorts of different things. And that's where I really learned what goes into photography that it's not just the camera skill it's as much a human skill it's understanding uh how to access certain things better so yeah that was a really good practical school and yeah that was kind of my first first foray into that and this was already happening in australia right you were born in the ukraine and you moved at some point to to australia this this second chapter this you know the first camera and everything this was happening in australia right well actually the magazine job that was still in ukraine so i moved to australia 20 years ago and this first gig in the magazine that was i think around year 2000 2002 maybe so yeah that was over over 20 years ago And in Australia, I still kept that passion. It kind of shifted a little bit because I started traveling a lot more. And I think photography reflects your interests in life as well. So when I was younger, for me, it was really interesting to be able, I guess, to meet some celebrities, shoot like some famous people. Then as I started traveling, my photography started reflecting the experiences that I went through as we just kind of started um, going around the world and visiting interesting places. And I did have commercial gigs as well, um, some advertising shoots, even weddings, just because 
at least you can pay for your equipment, right? And then it really kind of became a little bit too much because you, when you start doing something out of passion, but then you make it a job, it starts to kill that kind of joy sometimes because you have to fulfill client briefs, you have to process a lot of images, and you kind of it just takes the soul away from it, and it starts to become a bit of a too much of a nine to five, or sometimes nine to twelve. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Rather the the, the the yeah the late the, the latter option, right? I had, I remember working on some weddings in in the past. Yeah, it was rather twelve, you know, one a.m. sometimes, right? Hundred <laughs> percent. And after that, I kind of thought, you know what? I'm not just enjoying this as much. It's good in terms of income, and you can afford buying lenses that you want to. But like, there was not much like soul in it, so I just stepped back. And I went actually back into film as well because I realized that film lets you, it has like certain benefits of you think a lot more about what you do. You kind of, you, there's a cost on every shot, on every frame. I shoot medium format, uh, mostly six by seven, and you get 10 shots per roll. So you have to really think what goes onto that roll. And you just stop, it just stops you shooting something that you wouldn't want to shoot otherwise. On the digital, it's easy. It's just too easy. And also, I shoot on the manual focus camera without light, like light metering and build. So you kind of have to really think about where you position yourself, how the light works. It just kind of slows you down so much. And I can actually remember perhaps every shot I take on the medium format it just puts me into this kind of a lot more aware aware mode of doing things and i just really enjoy it so and that's kind of how the rocket girl chronicles came about i actually went to uh obviously again as i said photography reflects your interests and once i had a child naturally you start to photograph how they grow up and i guess what happens to to them and it just kind of became my focus after that yeah so okay let, let's jump straight into you know the, the 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 project i mean the rocket girls chronicles to kind of put you on the international scene you know uh exhibitions you have a book you know uh interviews all over the place uh what a what a brilliant you know nice idea, exactly working with your daughter. How, how old uh, uh, was she at that at the time when you started working on this project? She was four and two months. Yeah, four years old and two months. Yeah, so you know well before when I was thinking about you exactly working with an analog camera, and now you mentioned the patience and the time and uh, you know you need for each shot. I w- because I have small kids. I mean they are now a bit older than that, but not much. So I know what it means, you know, what a f- four-year-old means. So this combined with the time and patience of, of, of taking, you know, analog shots, how did it work out? She was really, she was really collaborating, participating in the process, right? Respect. <laughs> well, um, if you do have, or if you have experience with four-year-olds, you know, probably that they don't really collaborate. They just do their own thing. So the biggest learning was that, it's not about taking images. It's about family time first. If I manage to get a good opportunity to photograph, that's a bonus. But that's another thing. If you don't approach it as a project, if you don't think about it as a job, then you don't have that pressure. So you don't really have a client. You don't really shoot for objective to do something. You want to capture a memory. If she moves out of the shot and does something else, it's fine. Like, it's not that reason. I think that kind of mindset, not having a client, not trying to make a project, that's maybe what made it a success because more often than not, would go somewhere and I would not shoot a frame because there wasn't a good light or a good scene, a good opportunity. And you don't really want to spoil the time one-on-one with your child by making it project focused so I kind of try to wait for those moments and if they do come I would try and make it work if they don't 
it's fine. I still had a great time and we still explored something. There's something to talk about. So I think the secret is just yeah, to yeah. not mm. make it a photo project, just make it a family time. Tell us about the origins of the project. So I know, uh, I mean, it was it was COVID time. You know, the pandemic just uh, uh, you know came around and the lockdowns all over the place. Your long lockdowns and some small you know areas you were allowed to walk around right in. We we know what it was. Uh, I think your wife was also involved, right, with the with the space helmet. She helped you know creating the helmet, the costume. Originally, was it your idea the whole thing? I mean, wait, your 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 daughter was kind of interested already in, in, in space stories and, and space uh, tales. How did it all start? Was it a moment, just single moment at the table, family table? Where was the like, beginning? I think it's a combination of things, as I guess all lucky things are. They're a bit of a combination. There's one, no one thing, but things just kind of fell into place. It's probably my daughter's idea more than anything because obviously she was the one that who was into space and obviously as a kid you just read her books like story time uh, and the space theme was something that really got her like she got really fixated on this topic and she started asking millions of questions and I was just googling everything myself honestly I learned more about space <laughs> just trying to answer her questions that i ever did in my previous life but <laughs> as kids do they kind of teach you as much uh, but at the same time i think family craft was one of the typical things to do and melbourne this actually didn't happen immediately we had five lockdowns before that and we just tried different things the usual things and when this project came about that was lockdown number six and we were close to like 200 days under restrictions and so we kind of tried all the normal things and then we thought you know what is she if she's so interested in space how about we'll just try and craft something for her and show her also like how the clothes can be made from scratch because my wife she graduated as a theater costume designer so she had those skills and we did the helmet from the papier mache so there was no photography project at all on the radar like 100 percent and obviously once we made the costume she put it on and as kids do she just wouldn't take it off she wanted to kind of go everywhere in it and we had one walk per day allowed to be outside for a maximum of two hours and i think five kilometer radius so we just kind of went she obviously just had the costume on and we started doing our daily walks. I didn't take my camera at first. I just took a few snaps on the phone, but just because I was also documenting her growing up, I thought what a good opportunity to kind of get my proper camera and just take a few snap snaps just for mm -hmm. our own memories. Um, and I put them on Instagram, I think, and my friends said, look, this is amazing. This is really special. Like this is, yeah, this is great. You should... Um, yeah, more people mm -hmm. should see it, and I th think. Yeah, I, I was about just sort of just to jump in quickly because I was trying to put a finger on when was the. I mean, today the entire world kind of knows about your project. Was this the moment? Do you know the first images you put on Instagram just privately that you realized that you are onto something special here, photographically? Um, I think so because you, I guess, question yourself, and you don't really think that you've done something amazing just just out of nowhere for me it was never a focus and i guess because it was never a job or objective i didn't even put this thought into my mind i didn't try to make it popular in any way so it kind of just wasn't even on my radar but a few people who i really respect in visual arts space who obviously followed me and who i followed they just saw these images and said you know what this is this is really special and like maybe like i it's hard to judge your own work as well because when you do something how, how where do you put it so uh in a way i guess people convinced me that it's it's something worthwhile and something that is interesting beyond just our family mm -hmm. okay uh 
let's look at three. You know, I selected maybe three or four images, I think, from the series. Um, let's look at them. And especially, you know, you, ju you just mentioned before, because it's an analog photography. So, you know, less frames per, <laughs> per minute, per hour. You will probably remember, you know, the the exact situations way more vividly than it would be with, you know, digital shots. So let me let me try sharing the screen here. I hope it will work just fine. Let's see. Um, yeah, I remember this image very well indeed. Th this one is the, the most famous... Is it the most famous photograph from the series in a way? I think it has been featured in, in many, many different places, right? Yes, I think it has been and like... I don't try to track them as either most popular or least popular because I think it's kind of a bit of an... If you look at it from the social media perspective, there's a bit of, I guess, luck and algorithm involved. But yeah, it it has been featured in a few places. And uh, I remember it very well. So there's this area not so far from where we live. It's called Morabin. And uh, we shot a lot of these images actually in that area because it was one of the places where there was least amount of people there was least amount of i guess encounters and it felt like it was quite a different world so there's a lot of factories and uh, i guess it's not really kind of industrial area it's more of a uh, manufacturing area where people make certain uh, i guess products and we really loved exploring that because all of the businesses were closed during COVID. So all of this area was completely empty and we just loved um, walking along the streets and you could see really interesting uh, things there. And there was this uh, bus just parked there. Uh, I saw the geometry of the factory buildings behind it and I thought this... I just kind of visualized it in my head and I thought this looks just amazing. And of course, for my daughter, she got really interested because she never saw buses like this before, ever. It's not something that roams the streets on the daily basis. So she had a mm. really bluff, yeah. <laughs> just ro roaming around, running, uh, trying to peek into windows. She obviously tried to get into it, but all of the doors were locked. And after she got a bit of, I guess tired um she just found this little step and sat on the step just to uh, um i guess stretch her legs a little bit and i saw that frame and i told her hey just wait wait a second and i set up set up the camera took i, I took a few shots but i think this one this one was one out of three and it just had everything perfect i think with that with those lines mm. and the bar, well, that little patch of mm -hmm. grass. Yeah. When was it, you know, do you remember when, when it was, you know, during the process of, of working, you know, on the entire project that you realized um, and in what way, you know, that you, that you are going after a certain look, certain maybe emotional impact of this series, also in terms of composition, you know, the, the, the colors, the, are all of the images, they are not square, right? They are not square. So this is six by four, right? Six by seven. Six by, sorry, six by seven. Uh, so there is a certain aesthetics, you know, a certain continuity to the series. When, when, when did you realize and when did you, when you, when did you con consciously, you know, started working in a certain direction and thinking about it as a series? Um, Good question. Uh, I think, again, it's maybe few pieces of puzzle fell into place because in terms of emotion, I think it was certain mood at the time in the world. There was this kind of uncertainty around what will happen to us, I guess, as co collectively and certain amount of isolation. So I think that kind of old feeling around especially having a young child growing up in very uncertain times i think the mood itself like in the setting in which we were at the time it really set the tone and this was perhaps the creative impulse and in terms of 
look and aesthetic mm. it was more dictated by the fact that i don't know how to shoot in broad daylight so most of the images that you will find they were shot either in more like twilight setting i don't really kind of understand well when you have harsh shadows and how to shoot in the conditions where you have too too much of a difference between light and shade so and <laughs> funny enough me having to work from home during the day a lot of the outings had to be after i finish my day job which would be again more of an evening time which is perfect for me as well so mm-hmm. it kind of was dictated by a few factors and I guess final factor that relates to the colors and look and feel is the film itself. Unfortunately, this particular film is now discontinued, so I shot all of this pretty much on Fuji Pro 400H, which is really interesting film because if you overexpose it, it gives very specific, I guess, tint. It gives this green and yellow tones to the image. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I kind of figured out how to get the most out of that film in different conditions, and I experimented with it quite a bit, and it really kind of gave me... It was the tool that, I guess, shaped my craft a little bit because mm-hmm. I knew how to use that tool well in different lighting conditions, and like I found that if you shoot it at the certain angle of, I guess light going against the light and overexpose it it will make it like really intensely green and yellow and there are a few shots of that kind and yeah genuinely just i guess combination of me having to go out in the evening knowing how to get the most out of that light and also knowing how to get the most out of the film plus creative mood uh set by the pandemic yeah this particular image we are looking at right now uh, I, I hope the trains were not running it was locked down so did, did it help with the <laughs> with with staging it that's um the funny story is um, actually i think a few people were a little bit concerned around the tracks but these tracks are not train tracks they're tram so they're kind of just your standard suburban tram line and they are quite historic because they lead from the Port Melbourne Pier where the immigrants used to come to Australia. And they were originally train tracks. That's why you get all these like sleepers that are very heavy duty and it has like all of the characteristics of the train. But after the that facility kind of slowly uh, stopped being used, they turned it into a suburban train, uh, tram. And those trams... I believe they had some maintenance. So a lot of the works during the pandemic were undertaken because you could just like, there was no infrastructure and they could just maintain those things. So we saw, we were actually walking past and just saw them completely boarded over. And it was a storm going over the city. And then this kind of light shone on the buildings through the clouds for maybe five minutes. And I thought it's a, it's a really nice, I guess setting to just capture something and we were were crossing crossing those tram tracks and that was I think I took actually maybe two two shots just one after another and that's one of two and it just happened yeah yeah uh, how many photographs in this series you know today uh, uh, are officially in the entire project or book H- how many how many images over a hundred I actually didn't count them. Uh, but yeah, well over 100 because I have basically, I shot quite a few rolls, which I would review as I would scan it, develop it and scan it. And then I will pull out a couple of images that I thought were good. And then now, a few years later, I go through those old films and I still find images that I actually quite like that I just, for whatever reason, I skipped beforehand so yeah there's over 100 this one I, I i really like this one it's a bit different right from from the from the rest you know it's the reflection shot and uh was it something you were inten- intentionally going for or, or just you know 
maybe maybe framing something else originally. I I sense some kind of a you know <laughs> a sudden change of plans here. Is, is, am I correct or, or completely off? <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. This was a real spontaneous, spontaneous shot. Uh, to be honest, not a lot of shots are planned in terms of what we were supposed to capture. We planned the places that we wanted to go, and sometimes we would reach them, sometimes we would take a bit of a detour. But this was shot in an empty car park, um, again, after the rain, and she just loved roaming around empty places. As as all kids, she saw the puddle and she just couldn't help herself. Like, uh, I think the spacesuit was completely uh. wet after she <laughs> stopped jumping around. But yeah, she really <laughs> it was one of the first, I guess, encounters. And she quite cautiously stepped into it when she got, wanted, I guess, to check if her shoes will um, get wet through. And she's like, okay, this is working. So she just kind of stepped in and I saw this um, this reflection and there was this sign way out. And I thought, this is really interesting. It just made it that. And I looked at the puddle itself. I didn't really look at the scene outside. And I thought, it's like a portal. It's a bit of like a window into another world. You see almost this kind of the other side through it. And again, like I'm just, Stay there, do not move, just wait for it. And it, yeah, luckily, with a bit of ex no. yes, hands on experience, I knew what settings I needed to take. I didn't even measure the light, I can just guessed what could be the right, um, right shot okay. speed. And yeah, I snapped this one and it worked. So, so you were shooting the entire project with the Mamiya RZ, RZ67, right? Yep, that's the one. Um, it's uh, my the shots are the shots are uh, handheld or you were using a tripod at times both um, if I kind of developed a bit of a technique um, <laughs> how to try and get the shot so when we would go around and play somewhere I would try to look where would be a good where, where would good composition could lie I guess and I would try to set up the camera without Mia in the frame. So she, she would be just going around doing her thing and I would just try to compose something that, I guess, where I could envisage it being a good composition. And then I would just wait, I guess, wait mm -hmm. until she uh, explored most of the things when she is in a bit of a more settled, I guess, uh, uh, mood and... I would just say, do you want to check this out? Do you want to try this out? Most of the time she would say yes, because like, you, you know, I guess you know how to read your child when she is in that kind of, um, in that kind of mood where she settled and wants to just have a bit of a quiet moment. So I would try to shoot most of these at this point of time, but sometimes she would say no and I'll just, okay, that's, that's a no go. Nina. So, so is she still fascinated with you know space uh, these days today? Uh, she shifts her focus quite a bit, so it's not just space. He was she was very hyper fixated on space during this time. Obviously, as she grew, now she has lots of interests and jumps around, but she's still very much, I guess, um, curious about how the world operates. So it's not just space. It's like why certain things mm -hmm. happen, like the gravity, just general, I guess, laws of physics. Why why things happen? Yeah. What, what is the reason? Yeah, wonderful. And, and also, correct me if I'm right, so she was fascinating with, with you, exactly with space. I can see, is it your part here, some kind of a fascination, you know, with cars, automobile kind of, uh, because I'm seeing pr quite a few nice vehicles, you know, the buses are in there. Is it then your influence or you were kind of spontaneously choosing those locations ju just to, you know, when walking, walking around together? I think it is definitely both, uh, maybe more of me than her, <laughs> because for me, this is first of all, nostalgia. Because when I see an old vehicle, 
it brings the memories of my own childhood because I remember some of these vehicles, I guess, being on the road as I was growing up. So it kind of takes me back in a way. I see a bit of, I guess, um, I feel a little bit sad if I come across something that's neglected that I used to remember being like the dream when I was a child. But at the same time, it's also a story, I guess, of a journey. And when you are traveling your vehicles, your they are the means to go around the world. So I think it's this really good thematic connection there as well. And of course, for her to see something that mm. she doesn't really see in the genu- in, in the normal world, like when you come across uh, something like this car that no longer runs, that's overgrown with moss, there's a great opportunity for her to ask questions why. And yeah, I... I also love restoring old mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. I think I'm like one of those people who when I see something that's old and dysfunctional, I love to put it back to work. So it's, yeah, mo- probably most of it is my fault. Yeah. No, I think it, it, it's it's really some kind of magic, you know, which, which happened, I think, with the project. Uh, like you say, very spontaneous, you know, not really pre-planned, but then it started developing because I think this combination of every single element in this project, you know, the fact that you are shooting on this particular kind of, you know, film stock, so the colors, you know, of course, your your compositional skills, but then also com- combining those exactly old elements, abandoned places, old vehicles, with the fact that she's wearing this costume, which is kind of, you know, uh, space, it's, it's, you know, we connect it with future, we connect it with something unknown. So it, all every single of those frames uh, has something really magical, really <laughs> unusual about it. So, uh, yeah, you know, you say it happened by accident, but I still congratulate you on the project because it's it's really special. Uh, I wanted to ask you because um, after realizing that you got something special here, you know, that then you kept working on it. Uh, what did it do? if anything, to your own photography, to your own, uh, um, you know, thoughts, plans, maybe on on the direction you want to go with your photography? Where are you today? Are you kind of maybe continuing on similar ideas or directions? What what, what happened inside you as a photographer, you know, after, after yeah, experiencing this, this, this very special moment, right? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much, Tomas, for your kind words. Like, I really, yeah, appreciate it and very humbled. Um, it, it's a great question as well, because to me, I was, I guess, lucky to receive a lot of new opportunities where people offered me, I guess, shooting certain things for them or trying to license my imagery for certain purposes. So, Strangely enough, for me, it was rather than trying to go and capitalize on this, which I would have probably done when I was younger, I actually had to keep myself constrained and almost uh, refuse uh, something for the, I guess, commercial reasons, because this project is super personal to me, and obviously this is my child, and I wouldn't want to, I guess sell out something that started so naturally and make it a uh, just kind of make it a commercial and opportunistic thing so with every I guess opportunity that came in I had to almost ask myself is this does it fit the original story and idea like does it connect to it is it taking it too far is it too removed and in most cases, I basically had had to say no to those opportunities because they didn't seem quite right. And few things and few, I guess, uh, projects that came out, they really went along the original idea and narrative. And yeah, I agreed to those. And that's, I guess, how the book came about as well because I did receive a few, I guess, offers from the publishers as well to make it a body of work. But with publishers they need to make sure that the outcome is sustainable for them. And obviously they run 
it for reasons to keep afloat. For me, the reason for making this project wasn't really about getting famous or making money. So I thought, you know what, I'll just risk it. And I, uh, as you probably know, I put the book project on the kickstart and I was really lucky to get enough people to support it, to be able to make that print run. Uh, so that was kind of the thing. Uh, there was definitely amazing opportunities and something I'm really grateful for, but I, rather than trying to make the most out of it, I almost had to put myself back to, I guess, keep the, keep it honest, I guess. Mm -hmm. What is your photography doing these days? Are you working on any any things, any projects, or maybe you know working professionally? Just you know projects for clients, or what are you doing these days? Yeah, it took me most uh, a lot of, I guess, time and effort to get the book out. So that really took me almost a year uh, to get it done and uh, sequence everything. So that was yeah, almost like a year away from photographing and now I'm just at the point when I think I got enough headspace and hopefully time as well to start photographing again. I want to go uh, back to large format as well because again during the pandemic I shot uh, quite a few large large format images and I really enjoyed it uh, and now I really want to kind of get the most out of it. I have um, quite a few lenses uh, that I want to try, um, more than 100 year old, year, years old ones, and just kind of try and experiment a little bit more. And of course, naturally, I want to keep documenting my daughter growing up. Uh, maybe I will have a new project that will come out of it, but I'm not pursuing anything really, I guess, actively. I think it's more like I want to reflect on what I already know and just document my life in a way nice and your daughter she must be today uh, seven or eight probably right uh, turning seven this year in a few months. somewhere around there turning seven how how uh, how does she react to to you know uh, when looking at those photos again i mean like uh, what do they mean to her it's, it's i can imagine it's much fun at home right uh, looking sometimes through those through those friends she really loves certain, I guess, places that she visited. And for her, these images is like a bit of a gateway. It's like a, like a little portal to the place where we went to. And when she sees certain ones of them, she's like, you know what? I want to go there again. And that sometimes make, makes my plans on the weekend because she says, I remember that place. Let's go again and revisit it. And we just go there, obviously, without the camera or anything just to see. And what what is really interesting as well is that some of those places really have changed and some of like that a photograph that you showed with the red car i think we went there a few months ago and that red bmw is no longer there and this gives it this kind of i guess specialty as well that we captured the time with those artifacts that are perishable that you know that was just that slice of time with us mm -hmm. in it and it gives it uh, a bit of, I guess, nostalgic value for me as well. Yeah, wonderful, uh, Andrew. Wishing you all the best. Who knows? Maybe it comes one day to a, you know, to a remake or something like this. Maybe you and your daughter in a, in, in some years will will you know work on some kind of a follow up project to this. But but whatever you might be you know doing or maybe dreaming about in photographically, you must have some ideas on the, on the you know back of your head. Wishing you all the best. We'll be following you. I will be linking to everything. The book is available, right? The book is available to your website? Yes, it is. You can actually probably see me in my background there with that, yeah, little arrow. Yeah, okay. So I will link to everything. I mean, uh, I think I will be ordering myself uh, one copy. Finally, I don't have one. So, <laughs> I mean, this was a special moment in the, in the you know, photography, uh, on the photography scene in the, in the last couple of words. Really something special happened and I love the images. Uh, yeah, looking forward to, 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 you know, whatever you, you create in the future. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea. We, we, we stay in touch. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Tomasz. All the best.